We are here in Whittier, Alaska and I am really excited because I'm going to set off now for the first time sailing alone, sailing solo on this boat here. I'm gonna head into the Prince William Sound and spend almost a month just exploring alone. Before I sail away, I set up a few quick rules for myself. First of all, no harbors, only anchoring. Second, no intentional seeking of company, just 30 days of solitude. Third, I want to catch some shrimp and fish. And fourth, I want to ski directly from the boat. But now, let's take a quick look at Whittier too, because this is a special place. The town was originally established for military use during the Cold War. This here is the Buckner building and was called the city under one roof. Doesn't look so great anymore. The other tower is still in use and houses the majority of the current residents and most of the town's services. The only access to the town is through a tunnel that closes during the night. It's perhaps not the cutest little place, but it provides a convenient access point to Prince William Sound, so the harbor is filled with all kinds of fishing and recreational boats. And even though it's May, it's still very snowy and feels like winter, so I really want to set off to sail some of the mountains that are just waiting for me to ski them. So now let's get back to our upcoming adventure. It's gonna be fun, but it's gonna be a little bit exciting because I haven't really sailed a boat of this size alone at all. Um, so it's gonna be an experience. First of all though, I need to fix or replace the windlass. So the anchor windlass, it's broken, it needs to be replaced. The windlass replacement was yet another easy two-hour boat job. I don't want to bore you with the details, but two days and two thousand dollars later, the new windlass was finally ready for a test run. It's so friggin' messy here, it started raining, of course everything is wet. Okay, down. Okay, the clutch is not tight enough. Okay, that seems good to me. Pretty much the most exciting part of the day is gonna come first, so we need to get some fuel from the fuel dock over there. I also need some water. The water taps on the docks are not open yet because uh, there's still a risk of freezing. So the fuel dock, it has water, but I just need to get there. It's always the har harbor maneuvers that are going to be a little bit difficult when you are alone. Usually when I'm alone, this uh, center spring line is what I like to um, tie in first when I'm mooring. But now it doesn't really matter because I think the wind is push going to push us onto the fuel dock any anyway. So. Um, I might not need this at all. I put the um, bow line, I let it aft to the center of the boat as well, so you can just grab it when you step off. I'm not really sure how much the at attendants here are going to help me, if there's an attendant at the uh, gas station that helps you or not. But we're gonna see that soon. Thank you. 
All right, we are done. Yeah, that wasn't such a super clean docking at the fuel dock. Uh, you know, I kind of slid sideways and I was unable to turn the bow to starboard enough. I mean, it was fine, but it could have been nicer. The problem with this boat is that if you don't have the centerboard down, then the bow really likes to slide um, with the wind. So if the wind is coming from the side, the bow will fall off very, very quickly. So if you want to make the harbor maneuvers easier, you should actually have the centerboard down. It makes the harbor maneuvers easier. Uh, but if you don't have the centerboard down, it's more of like a power boat. It makes things faster, uh, it makes things harder, especially at slow speeds. So one of the things that I do actually when I'm solo like this, is uh, as soon as I get out of the harbor, I move outside of the 250 meter contour. So I always stay in water that's deeper than 250 meters. That's like seven, 800 feet. Because in such deep water, you usually don't have shrimp pots. The commercial fishermen, especially, I think they put shrimp pots all the way down to like 200 meters. But if you are deeper than that, 250 meters, then you're not gonna have pots. Then you have one less thing to worry about. Because especially now when we are motoring, in the propeller. And yes, we are motoring and we will likely be motoring um, the whole evening today. We actually left from the fuel dock at 7 p.m. I have a really cool anchorage in mind, but uh, we are gonna make it to the anchorage at around 11 p.m., which is like half an hour after the sunset. One of the reasons that I'm going so late is that now we are going to be entering on a rising tide and it's going to be at least half tide, so... We should be good even though it's shallow and narrow. We will see. This here is by the way where we are going. So inside this lagoon here. And yeah, it's very narrow and it's not really charted. And our guidebook here, what does it say? Boats drawing more than four feet should not enter or leave until several hours after minus tide. So Right now we are at um, around plus two or three meters from the um, zero tide level. So we should be good in that regard. But um, as you might have seen on the chart, it's a very narrow entrance. And right now I don't have anyone at the bow looking for rocks or anything like that. It also says, do not make an immediate turn to starboard when the lag lagoon comes into sight as a shoal makes of the southeast shore just inside the lagoon. However, do not proceed too far before turning either, because there is another shallow. So, yeah, don't, don't turn too quickly, but don't turn too late either. That is very helpful. We're gonna go and see how it goes. I'm gonna try something new here, and for that I'm going to make a special feed. Add some of these pellets here. We add some of this stuff. I don't know how much you're supposed to put. I have no clue. And then the icing on the cake. Oh shit, this smells bad. So obviously I'm making shrimp bait here. We're gonna try and get some shrimp now. Um, I have never tried this before, but I have just acquired the shrimp pot. And I have a general idea of what to do. All right, our pot setup is ready. And we are going to set it here. Even though I know that this is not an ideal spot, it's a little bit too shallow. But I want this to be close enough to the anchorage so that I can come with the dinghy and pick it up tomorrow. And the main objective here for me is that I just don't want to get this tangled in the propeller. Or in the rudder. So...
Seven meters. Maybe a little bit too far on the port side. Here I'm getting nervous because even though I'm past the narrowest spot, the water is just getting shallower and shallower. If this was during low tide, I'd probably be grounded already. Oh shit, it's still getting shallower. Two meters. Oh man, this is... Wall stretch of just two meters of water here. Okay, now it's getting deeper in three and a half. Okay, first time ever anchoring with the new windlass. Let's see. I'm gonna set this thing just to set the anchor with this. So I don't want to place the load on the windlass. Yeah, 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 we are good, we are good. It's holding very well. Good morning. It's very rainy and drizzly outside. I have my water here on the stove boiling for me and we got some hot chocolate and my slightly dirty mug. You see I have been watching some uh, lifestyle vloggers on YouTube recently and this is the classic lifestyle segment you know you wake up in the morning you get ready for the day you uh, make a really nice cup of coffee with your presso maker or whatever or some fancy Bialetti thing and uh, so on but I don't really drink coffee and when I do it's instant coffee so yeah everything is ruined there we go and now we're gonna go outside I might try and make this into a nice morning routine, you know. It's kind of nice to come and sit under the dodger even if the weather is really bad and just have a look around because it's easy to get stuck inside when the weather is not so great and then you're just sitting in there the whole day working on your laptop. Bald eagle pooping. Pooping. Oh my god. Bad jokes aside, it really is incredible to wake up in a place like this, even if the weather is a bit misty. It feels like being in a movie.
Now the weather is clearing up actually a little bit, so we are probably gonna go and um, check the shrimp pot later today. But I'm sure you are eager for some sailing. I'm eager for some sailing as well. But uh, the next few days the weather is going to be really bad. So we're gonna be sitting here maybe for a while. But then after that we have to haul P Prince William Sound to explore. So let me show you. This is the whole area that we have. It's around 80 miles by 80 miles. We're gonna be sailing around here for a month. And then to end this journey we are gonna go either probably either to Valdez or to Seward. Seward is over here. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention the skiing season is of course still on. So there's plenty of snow around. We just need the weather to get a little bit better. All right, time to go and check that shrimp pot. See how many shrimp we did not get. This is my emergency equipment. I always try to take it with me. Just some stuff to patch the dinghy if needed to, and a pump, and a, an emergency, like a personal locator beacon, and so on. All right, here is our pot. Expertly marked with a fender and two uh, shrink pot buoys. Just put it in the bucket right now. And the end of the line, I just tie it off somewhere. I'm gonna tie it off to this handle afterwards. Because if you leave the end of the line inside the bucket, it can go through one of these loops and that's gonna make a big, big mess. That's gonna make a big knot and you really don't want that. I can tell you right now that it does not feel heavy at all, which is a little bit unfortunate. Okay, here we go. And... Oh, <laughs> there is one freaking shrimp in there. <laughs> That's so funny. There were two, but one of them fell out. So, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's exactly one shrimp in here. Shrimpity shrimp. Yeah. Sorry for the small interruption here. But if you're enjoying the video, then please consider subscribing to the channel. It's completely free and it helps me out. And my YouTube statistics actually show that even most of the returning viewers haven't subscribed. Now let's get back to the actual video. Where is our shrimp? All right, guys, dinner time. We have our delicious shrimp here. And how are we gonna prepare it? Well, of course, we are gonna pan fry this thing. Just need some butter. Okay, the pan is hot. We put the shrimp on the pan. Just 30 seconds on one side, and that's enough. Now flip it. Yummy, yummy shrimp. Yeah, it's ready. Put shrimp on a plate. Have to wipe the plate, you know, presentation is important. We have a salad. And last but not least, we have some shrimp noodles. Already prepared. You know, I was supposed to not get any shrimp so I, so I could make a joke about still being able to eat shrimp by cooking these delicious noodles, but now I got a shrimp, so the choke doesn't really work. However, 
I mean these noodles are of course just pure trash so I'm not gonna ruin the shrimp by putting the shrimp in there or anything I'm just gonna eat the shrimp like this mm, that's so good mm. that's a good beer too The next several days blurred into each other as the rain continued seemingly non-stop and in great amounts. I spent most of my days editing these videos and checking out the wildlife with my binoculars and my telephoto lens. Sea otters are one of the cutest creatures around the area. They were almost hunted and exploited to extinction because of their fur, but the population is now recovering. And that's good, because they eat about 25% of their body weight of food per day and are hugely important in the ecosystem by munching on sea urchins and other shellfish, which would otherwise decimate the kelp beds. Otters are one of the very few animals that use tools, namely they use rocks to crack open the shellfish. You can see the mothers floating around with their pups on their chest, like this one here in the center of the shot. The pups can't really swim when they are born, and they just rely on their fluffy fur to keep them afloat. And this here is what they sound like when they call out to each other. I'm here on my afternoon dinghy ride. The rain has paused, which is pretty incredible. And do you see that behind me? Something um, pretty cool. A really big avalanche that has come down during the last couple of days. So this wasn't there when we came here. It's come down the whole mountain. A wet snow avalanche. You see how it has taken some trees with it. With it. This is the pile of snow and then you can see at the top you can see the crack, you can see how the whole face has come down. So now you maybe get a better sense of the scale of things because uh, these trees are what the avalanche brought with it and uh, these are really big trees. This pile at least 10 meters high, 30 feet. You see the biggest pile of snow there? Oh, that's, <laughs> that's huge. Just a quick comparison of me and the snow pile here. Um, yeah, it's like way up there. But I don't wanna hang out here for too long. I'm gonna get going. Probably not the best spot, even though I don't think there's gonna be another one. Usually these spring avalanches, once they, once the face has been flushed out once, there's not gonna be like a really big one anymore. But there's always a small chance, I guess. This is like the result of the rain that we've been having the last few days. It's just that this rain just saturates the whole snowpack and it gets rid of everything that kind of like bonds the snowpack together the snowpack just becomes like a big rotten mess a mushy mess and and all the steep phases are just gonna slide and then this snow you know when something just small slides it's gonna take all of the other wet crappy rotten snow with it so this is the reason why i am not 
than skiing right now. A lot of the snow has ended up in the water and then the high tide took it away. A lot of the trees also ended up in the water and then the high tide took those away as well. And those are gonna be the trees that we are gonna be dodging uh, then with the sailboat because those are just gonna be floating around. And uh, those are the really nasty ones that you can hit with your boat. So yeah, that's a lesson in the humility in the nature. Now let's go and check the shrimp pot. I did actually put a shrimp pot down and it's in a better spot than it was previously. So I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful. We're gonna get a lot of shrimp. Let me see. Oh yeah, we got some guys. That's not a huge amount, but that's still some. We have like around 15 and these are big. Let's check the other creatures first. So we have a sea star. This one goes back to water. Then we have, uh, I don't know what you call this in English. Back to water as well. This one back to water. And then the shrimp I'm gonna put in the bucket here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. That's gonna make a good meal already. I'm gonna rebait the pot and uh, drop it back in. I placed the pot here under this uh, slope because I think that it drops off quite quickly here. And I've heard that um, you should put the pot maybe on a steep slope. You can see on this one too, all the recent avalanches that have come down. So in these avalanches, I see a lot of trees that are 200 years old at least. And that tells me that this avalanche cycle is not normal. It's a pretty rare cycle that we have going on right now. And of course, you know, that's, I know that because if a tree has stood in its place for 200 years successfully and an avalanche hasn't taken it out, but then suddenly there's an avalanche that takes it out and I see it happening on multiple phases here. That means that it's like a no, not a normal event that we have going on over here. And of course these massive spring avalanches are caused by the rain and by this huge amount of rain that we've been having the last several days. It's of course impossible to say whether this particular event um, was because of um, climate change or not, because you know weather and climate change they are not the same thing. But it's probably pretty safe to say that uh, these kind of weather events are getting more common here. I don't really know the area so well, so I can't really say for sure. This is um, what we are gonna probably going to be seeing in this area. More of this in the future. Unfortunately, it also ruin ruins the spring skiing because we need something a little bit drier weather to be able to ski and not get killed by these kind of avalanches. Anyway, now back to the boat. Welcome to Lumi's kitchen. I would have never believed that someday I would be making cooking content, but here we are. We have our shrimp here, half of them with the shell on and half of them with the shell taken off. And then some garlic, butter, lemon, and we're also gonna use some of this wine. 
And of course, we are going to start off with just a bit of uh, salt, cayenne, pepper as well, just a tiny little bit, not too much. Toss the shrimp. When the butter is foamy, we add our garlic. A little bit of lemon juice. I'm gonna wait for this to reduce a little bit. Just a couple of minutes. Now just add the shrimp. Two or three minutes, not more. I'm gonna add the rest of the butter now as well. Just a tiny bit of lemon juice maybe. That's it. I mean, just look at this. Look at this, guys. Now, what I'm gonna eat with this, I'm gonna keep it simple, stupid. Um, just add some olive oil to the pan. Plenty of olive oil, actually. And then I have this cheap bread that's turning like... Uh, it's gonna go bad soon. So, a couple slices of bread. Just scoop it all up. Oh my god, this is gonna be so good. I'm so excited. I kind of like this uh, shrimping thing. It's, uh, well, I, I probably got lucky right now, but it seems somewhat easy. And then the thing is the cleanup is really easy with this shrimp. You don't really have to do um, that much and it doesn't smell fishy and doesn't get everything like super uh, super uh, dirty either it's all pretty like civilized and easy and i like it easy because we when we fish or try to catch shrimp or whatever we do it for the food usually you know i just like eating i like eating this stuff i'm not that much of a fisherman i just like an easy catch and something easy to eat so here we have a bit of shrimp toast I'm just gonna try it here real quick and give you my opinion. That is so good. So now let's see if what's better, the ones with um, without the shell. And a lot of people say that the ones that if you leave the shell on, then they're gonna be juicier. Like they can, they will retain more of their. Um, more of their flavor so some people say it's better to leave the shells on I don't really know I'm gonna try this one had a shell so this one tastes less like it has less of the taste from the frying of course because it wasn't touching the pan directly but it is it is juicier hard to pick out a favorite to be honest both are really good I'm gonna go and eat the rest of this off the camera because filming this it takes maybe a little bit away from the experience. Not that much though, maybe we'll do more of these cooking shows in the future. <laughs> I have a fish! In the next episode of this series I get to do a lot more cool stuff. That's a bear track right over there. If you enjoyed this one, please consider oh, yeah. subscribing to the channel. <laughs> It is completely free and helps me out. And if you want to financially support the creation of these videos, check out the Patreon page. The next episode is already live on Patreon and will be here on YouTube next weekend. See you all next time. Bye bye.